This time we're going to look at some of the most common objections to the Georgist remedy, some of the frequently asked questions. What was that remedy again? The single tax. In other words, the public collection of the rent of land and natural resources and the abolition of taxes on production. Sometimes going over the arguments pro and con can really help to bring ideas into focus. So let's get to it. Isn't land less important in today's economy than it was a century ago? Not at all. In fact, land is more important now. Remember, the most important economic aspect of land is its value, not its area. Our most valuable natural resource by far is urban land. Center city sites aren't valuable because of what you can grow on them or what you can dig out of them, but simply because where they are the concentrated population and infrastructure investment that makes their productive potential so high. Furthermore, as we saw in the great crash of 2008, land is intertwined in modern banking and finance. Land is the asset that is most widely used as collateral for loans. This is an unhealthy practice, though it is a pervasive one. And if we want to understand the importance of land to the modern economy, we have to reckon with its role in banking and finance. Isn't the private ownership of land based on voluntary transactions and is therefore morally okay? We have seen that every person needs land in order to live. If we cannot get land unless we pay a private owner for access to it, then we're essentially paying that private owner for our right to live. If you have to either agree to a transaction or starve, that transaction cannot be said to be voluntary. Now, one might argue that most people in today's world don't work the land in order to grow their own food, yet they do eat, and indeed the cost of food has steadily declined. That shows the amount of economic cooperation and specialization that takes place in a modern economy. Nevertheless, if people had no other way to get food, they could work on land to get it, if they could get access to land. In many third world or developing countries today, this issue is not theoretical. Poor people are fighting for access to land on which to create their own subsistence. Won't land value taxation increase the price of land the way sales taxes increase the prices of consumer goods? It's true that a tax on consumer goods tends to increase their price. That's because suppliers compete to bring those goods to market. Competition tends to bring the price of such goods down to the lowest level at which their producers can make a profit. If a tax is applied to all the goods equally, the producers cannot accept a lower price and still make a profit, so the price has to go up by the amount of the tax. This is not the case with land because there are no competing suppliers for land. People who wish to use a particular piece of land bid up its value to the highest that they are willing to pay. The only alternative is not to use that site. The price can't get any higher because if it did, it would no longer be profitable for the user to pay to use that land. That's why a tax on land value will not increase the price of land. It will simply divide the land rent between the landowner and the government. This principle holds true in general unless there's some regulation that keeps landowners from collecting the full rent. An interesting, instructive example of this can be seen in New York City today. Rents in New York City are extremely high. In order to make housing more affordable for ordinary, ordinary working people in the city, residential apartment rents have been regulated for many decades. They can only rise by a certain specified amount each year. Even though the net number of such units decreases every year, over 60% of New Yorkers still live in rent-stabilized apartments. If a lessee has held a rent-stabilized apartment for a long time, its rent can end up very far below what a market rent would be. Landlords are required to keep renting to such tenants for as long as they keep in the apartment and pay their rent. However, the owners would prefer to turn the apartments into condos or co-ops that can be sold as individual units at market prices. To do this, they must get the tenant to give up their lease and often they're willing to pay large sums to make this happen. Anyway, it's widely understood that renters in a rent-regulated system do pay the portion of the tax that falls on land value, but that's only because the law doesn't allow their landlords to collect the full land rent. On to our next question, a related one. The supply of land offered for sale in the market often changes, so why do Georgists say that land is a monopoly? 
In economics, a monopoly is a particular kind of market, one in which there are no competing suppliers for the thing being sold. Another example of a monopoly is the market for paintings by Van Gogh. At a given time, more or fewer Van Gogh paintings can be offered for sale, but no more can be created because the artist is no longer with us. Thus, the price of a particular Van Gogh painting is the highest that the buyer is willing to pay rather than go without that painting. That is also how the price of land sites is determined. Land, though, is economically far more important than unique works of art. A Van Gogh painting can sell for tens of millions of dollars, but that doesn't stop anyone else from painting a picture and selling it. Exclusive land ownership, on the other hand, denies people access to the resources they need to make a living for themselves. Won't LVT hurt farmers? LVT, of course, is land value taxation, a widely used acronym. At first glance, it would seem that land value taxation would hurt farmers. Small farmers are threatened in many places, and one of their biggest difficulties is rising property tax burdens. They face competition from large corporate farms, bear the risk of unpredictable weather conditions and outside market forces. Then, as cities and towns sprawl outward, the farmland acquires value for residential subdivision or commercial development. Such lands tend to be worth far more than farmland, and so the higher potential uses constantly push up farmers' tax assessments. This has led to a widespread movement for current use discounts for land preserved in traditional farming, fishing, or forestry uses. What the Georgist remedy would ultimately do, however, is to remove many of the ways that our economy currently hurts farmers. Taxes on farm products and farm equipment raise costs in ways that hurt small farmers the most, making it much harder to compete against agribusiness. Removing such taxes, as well as the property tax that falls on homes and other farm buildings, would be a great help to farmers. Furthermore, land value taxation would ease the outward pressure of urban sprawl. In an LVT system, the tax on farmland would be appropriate to its use as farmland, not inflated by sprawl development pressure. It's important to remember that the Georgist remedy calls for public revenue to come from a tax on land value, not on land area. By far, the highest revenues would be raised from urban land. Farmland has a relatively low value per unit of area. If you tax away land's value, it won't have value anymore. So can't LVT only be collected once? This argument was famously made by the Austrian economist Murray Rothbard in an attempt to discredit the Georgist remedy. Rothbard suggested that the land value tax would confiscate its own base, that nobody would be willing to pay for land anymore if its value is taxed. This argument misunderstands the difference between land's rent and its selling price, as we discussed in our last lesson. That land's selling price is based on its rent. In other words, the selling price represents the value of the ability to collect rent on the land in perpetuity. If the government collects the full land rent, it is no longer available to the landowner. There's no future stream of rent to be capitalized into a selling price, so no selling price. But the rent doesn't disappear. The landowner would still be willing to pay to use the site. In fact, we can expect the Georgist remedy to create economic efficiencies that would increase the rent of the best sites. How can you separate the value of land from the value of the improvements? This is routinely done today by real estate dealers and appraisers. The value of land is customarily estimated simply by knowing its size and location. When a building is destroyed, land value remains, and this frequently happens in cities as obsolete buildings are torn down to make way for larger, more appropriate developments. Modern geographic information systems make it possible to create public land value maps that can be instantly updated, making the maintenance and display of land value data easier than ever before. And if land values were to become a larger part of the overall tax picture, they would receive much more public scrutiny. Despite the fact that land values can be precisely estimated, many jurisdictions today do not assess land values accurately or consistently. There are many reasons for this. Property taxes are just one of the many tax burdens placed on individuals and businesses, yet because they are administered locally, they are more effectively protested and resisted. Local assessment roles are not frequently updated, and because building values can be depreciated for income tax purposes, the values of commercial buildings are often greatly overstated relative to land values. 
A rich man has a large mansion. A poor widow has a small house next door. Both lots have the same value. Is it right that they both pay the same tax? We may have a preconceived idea that fairness in taxation is a matter of ability to pay, but we've seen that this principle doesn't always pass the test of fairness. It's quite possible for someone who works hard, employs workers, produces wealth, to have the same ability to pay as someone who merely collects a monopoly rent without contributing to production at all. There's no reason in justice why the community should not charge poor widows as much for monopolizing valuable land as it charges rich men. In either case, it is a special privilege which should be paid for. In our sympathy for the rare widow in this situation, we shouldn't forget the hosts of working people who not only don't live next to mansions, but have no place to live at all except by some landlord's consent. In a Georgist economy, they would find it much easier to get a place to live than they do now. Shouldn't there be a free private market in land so it will be allocated to its highest and best uses? There are three related answers to this. First, remember that land is a monopoly. We've seen many ways in which the land market we have today fails to yield the benefits of a free market's invisible hand. We have a free private market in land now, and it leads to large areas of valuable land being held out of use. Incidentally, there was once a free private market in slaves as well. The second point is that the Georgia's proposal is not to have the government decide on how and when land should be used. The development and use of land would still be a free market process subject only to the legal protections for health and the environment. Landholders would decide what to build on their land and there would be a free market in all of the improvements and all the wealth that was created. A Georgist economy, in fact, would remove taxes that are currently levied on goods and workers. Such taxes can be seen as unjust confiscations of legitimately produced wealth. As such, they're restrictions on free private markets. For all of these reasons, a Georgist economy would be far closer to the free enterprise ideal than the mixed economy that we currently have. Though some people have made money by owning land, haven't others lost? Don't the losses offset the gains? Possibly. But what the land speculator loses, the community does not gain. What the land speculator gains, however, the community does lose. Consider an example. A land speculator has been betting that the city will locate a train station next to his lot. But the city chooses an alternate site. The first land speculator bears the loss, but the community is no worse off. However, the owner of the site where the train station does get built gets a windfall gain. Yet the community has to pay in fares and taxes for the transit service anyway. Land speculators receive income without making any contribution to production. Also, taxation of labor and capital is often a dead weight lost, not balanced by any gain. It just makes things less efficient. We explored in an earlier lesson the, how the elimination of land speculation would yield gains for the entire community. If someone buys land in good faith under the laws by which we live, would that person not be entitled to compensation for individual loss if we taxed away the value of his land? Well, even at present, if a landowner does not pay property taxes, the government will eventually seize their land without compensation. It can be argued that there are natural inalienable rights to property. Henry George, along with other classical liberal thinkers, argued that there are such rights based on each individual's right to oneself. The ultimate existence of such rights may be a matter of philosophical debate. However, legal rights to various kinds of property are a legislative matter and can be changed by the will of the people. Over the years, many people have advocated for land value taxation and the proposal has been put into application in several parts of the world. Notice, therefore, has been served that there is an effort in progress to accomplish community collection of rent by proper methods. As this movement grows, people can't be allowed to make bets that it will fail, and then when they lose their bets, to call upon government to compensate them for their loss. Note also that in a Georgia system, land titles will remain. The land won't even be just as good as before for producing or building, the removal of taxes on those buildings will make it even better. Is land rent a sufficient source of public revenue? This is a large enough question to merit its own segment. 
We'll look into it next time. Thanks for watching, everybody. Understanding Economics is a presentation of the Henry George School of Social Science with video work by the excellent Uladzimur Tukachu. Next time, we want to use rent for public revenue. Well, how much rent is there? <laughs>